This video is going to be on kidney stones and infection. So we'll talk about stones first. Stones? You get stones when something precipitates out. Yeah, you have too much of something and it gathers and precipitates out and becomes a stone. And then when you have a stone, you can obstruct your kidneys, obstruct outflow. So you get things like hydronephrosis, you can get UTIs. How would it present as? What are some symptoms? Well, is it gonna hurt? <laughs> yeah, it's gonna hurt. So you'll have flank pain, flank pain. And commonly you'll have hematuria. All right, so someone with sudden onset of flank pain, hematuria, one of your differentials has to be a kidney stone. Now, what are these compounds that, you know, there's too much of and can precipitate as a stone? Yeah? What are the types of stones? So the first one we're gonna talk about is calcium stones. And this is actually the most common, about 80% of stones are calcium stones. And they can either be calcium oxalate, or they can be calcium phosphate depending on the pH level. A uh, higher pH, more alkaline. Higher pH tends to favor phosphate. Sorry, higher pH. And you see more in children. Children. The easy way I remember is there's a P and phosphate, P and pH. So the more pH you get, the more phosphate, calcium phosphate stones you get. And then something they also like to ask, will you be able to see this on x-ray? Any stone any kidney stones, they always like to ask, will you be able to see it on x-ray? Will you be able to see calcium on x-ray? Yes, you will. So these are radio opaque. Radio opaque. And when you look at it on x-ray, you'll see that stone. If you want to look at it microscopically, what they look like is they look like an envelope. They look like an envelope. Okay. Now you're probably wondering what causes you know, excess calcium or what causes excess oxalate or what causes excess phosphate, what causes all these things to be in higher levels than normal and precipitate as a stone. Some causes of calcium stones include, all right, causes include, include things like drinking ethylene glycol because that turns into oxalic acid. You might remember this from our acid base talk. Things like excess vitamins C, because that affects oxalate excretion. Things like malabsorption, like in Crohn's or any sort of, sort of malabsorption. When you can't reabsorb things, things like fat, fat flows around. Why is that a problem? Well, usually here's oxalate. Here's calcium. Calcium likes to bind oxalate, yeah? And if you have fat floating around, if you have fat floating around, then calcium jumps ship and binds fat instead. So in malabsorption, you have a ton of fat and that causes calcium to bind to the fat instead. And that leaves your oxalate free, free to roam and free to build up and precipitate. And that's what causes the calcium oxalate stones. All right. So that's malabsorption. Some other causes that you should be aware of include hypocitrinuria when you have low citrate because citrate found in citrus foods stops calcium crystallization crystallization okay what are the treatment for calcium stones all right rx you can give citrate, kind of help this hypo citrinuria, so you can give citrate. You can also give a diuretic that takes up calcium from the urine. What diuretic takes up calcium from the urine? <laughs> if you said thighs, that diuretics, you're right. All right. So all my videos build on each other. You gotta make sure you know the previous video very well before you jump to the next video because you know I'm gonna ask you questions and I want you to participate. It helps you learn, all right? So thiazide diuretics takes up some of that calcium, stops it from precipitating as a stone. That's, that's all I wanna say about calcium stone. The second type of stone you get is ammonium, magnesium phosphate stones. That's quite a name. Sometimes we just shorten it as struvite stone. Struvite is the 
compound name for ammonium, magnesium, phosphate. So we just call it struvite stones. Struvite stones look kind of like a coffin lid. And that is very fitting because these can form massive stones, massive stones. They so big, these are kidneys, so big that they take up your entire kidney. They kind of look like horns. We call these stag horn stones, stag horn. So they can form massive stones and oftentimes your kidneys are, are gone. They're, they're unsalvageable. So I think a coffin lid look is pretty appropriate. Now again, like, like I said, they like to ask, okay, does it show up on x-ray? Well, you have some magnesium, so yes, it does show up on x-ray. So it's radio opaque, radio opaque. How do you form this? What causes these compounds to be made in excess and precipitate? Well, if you have urease, positive bugs, bugs in your urine, these turn urea into ammonia. That's what urease does. <laughs> ammonia is part of this. So you, that precipitates how you get these ammonia, magnesium, phosphate stones. Now ammonia is basic. So something else that you like to kind of throw in is that it likes to precipitate in high pH environments, okay? Alkaline urine environments. What are some ammonia bugs? If you're weak on micro, this is a great video to kind of save and then rewatch when you've done micro because I'm gonna ask you, what are some urease positive bugs? Now once you pause the video, tell me not only the bugs, but everything you know about the bugs. All right, so pause the video, I'll give you a second. Give you another second. All right, let's get started. These are Proteus, Staph, Saprophyticus, Club. I mean, there are a ton more, but if you were able to come up with these, then you're, you're in good shape. Now, what do you do treatment-wise? Well, if you do have a bug, you have to give antibiotics. And then also, if it's big enough, if it's a stack horn, then surgery is probably the most appropriate surgery. All right, two more and we'll be all done with stones. The third stone I wanna talk about is gonna be uric acid stones. And uric acid stones look kind of rhomboid shape. If you remember, uric acid is seen in gout, yeah? And they, in gout, they're kind of crystalline, kind of needle shape. So they kind of retain the same shape. And because uric acid is found in gout, the risk factors for uric acid stones are the same risk factors in gout. So things like, if you have gout, uh, alcohol, red meats, all that stuff, as well as things like cell turnover, remember when cells die, they lose their perine, that perine becomes uric acid. The cell turnover, low fluid, low fluid is seen in all, all these stones because when you have low fluid, when you're dry, things precipitate, yeah, things pre precipitate. So low fluid, arid environments, like deserts, again, that's placed to a low fluid level. Arid climates, And they might ask you, is this gonna be radiolucent, radio opaque? Uric acid is radiolucent. You won't be able to see it on an x-ray. Radiolucent. And then they might ask you, is it gonna be high pH or low pH? This is uric acid, is it not? So it's gonna be seen in low pH. All right. Now they might ask you, okay, what's the treatment? Treatment is the same as gout, alloperinol which blocks the uric acid pathway, perine pathway, as well as fixing the pH. So if you alkalize, alkalinize the urine with things like potassium bicarb. Makes, makes sense. Our last stone is one of my favorite. The last stone is one of my favorite. It is cysteine stones. And cysteine stones form this hexagonal shape. Okay, and cysteine is an amino acid. Is it gonna show up on an x-ray? No, it's gonna be radiolucent. What causes this excess cysteine? What causes this so much cysteine that it precipitates out of the stone? 
Well, in your PCT, we said it reabsorbs amino acids. And if something's wrong with those transport, if there's some sort of defect, hereditary defect in those transport, then you can't reabsorb those amino acids. Cysteine's an amino acid. If you can't reabsorb that, you have a ton of amino acids in your urine, and it can precipitate as a stone. Defective amino acid transport. Now, because it's hereditary, because it's uh, your now because it's a hereditary defect, you're gonna be you're gonna see it early on. You're gonna see it in kids. In kids, if a kid has a kidney stone. It's a cysteine stone. They don't have to say anything more. I mean, the question stem could be one sentence. They could say, kid has kidney stone. What is it? They can say literally that, and you know right off the bat it's a cysteine stone. All right, so I'm gonna put stars next to it. So you gotta know the scene in kids. Now there's something else you should know. Uh, this is probably, probably semantics, but I've been testing on this before. Cysteine isn't the only amino acid that isn't reabsorbed. You also can't reabsorb things like Ornithine, lysine, arginine. You can't reabsorb these either. So why do we call it cysteine stones? Why don't we call it cysteine, ornithine, lysine, arginine stones? Because cysteine is the least soluble. So that's the one that precipitates most. That's the one that gives us the most headaches. So we're like, all right, we understand these also all get, don't get reabsorbed, but you know, now cysteine's time to shine because that's the least soluble. All right, that's just something, some somatics, but I had have a had a question on this before. How do you make sure there are cysteine stones? You can give a test called sodium cyanide nitroprusside test. You get some urine from the kid, you put sodium cyanide nitroprusside in there. And cyanide turns turns cysteine to cysteine which is what we're looking for. And then natural side turns that purple. So the vial of urine will turn purple and you're like, that's not normal. <laughs> and then you know, all right, the kid actually does have cysteine stones. How do you treat it? Alkalinized urine seems to do the trick. All right, those are your stones. And we're gonna transition on to our next topic, which is gonna be infections. We said stones, you know, cause an obstruction that can cause hydronephrosis that can predispose you to infections. All right, so we're gonna talk a ton about infections. You can get infections from other things that are not stones. In fact, that's probably the most common way. In fact, stones causing infections are pretty rare. So what are the more common ways you get infections? More common ways you get infection is that Bacteria from around your perianal region go up your urethra. They start to travel up your urethra. And they finally get to your bladder. We call these ascending infections because they kind of wiggle their way up into your urethra. So ascending infections. And when they reach your bladder, we call that cystitis. Now, if they're contained within your bladder, they don't really have access to any blood. They just have access to your urine. So you don't get systemic signs. You don't get the fever. You don't get high uh, white blood cell count. So I'll say no fever systemic signs slash systemic signs. What you will have is going to be dysuria when you pee, right? Because it is, it is in your urethra, so you're going to have dysuria. You're also going to have kind of super pubic pain around your bladder. So, all right, super pubic pain plus dysuria. And let me redraw this. And if they're, and if they keep moving up, to your ureters, they will eventually hit your kidneys. They will eventually hit your kidneys and infect your kidneys. And this we call pyelonephritis. Now tell me, once in your kidneys, do they have access to blood supply? Your kidneys are super vascular. Of course they have access to blood supply. So you will see systemic symptoms. You will see fever. You will see systemic symptoms. High white blood cell count. 
you have a risk of sepsis because that bacteria has access to your bloodstream. All right, and is it gonna hurt? Yeah, it's gonna hurt. Yeah, especially in your cost over t angle. Best way to check for pilo, best way to check for pilo, you just pound on the back. Physical exam, and if they have pilo, they'll jump out of the, jump out of the, I actually seen that. They like jumped out of the little exam room bed. So what I wanna write, <laughs> hit back. This is right, hit back, you know what I'm talking about. Because they have that costal vertebral tenderness because their kidneys are infected. So that's pilo nephritis. Now, what are some common causes? Now, the most common bug for both the status and pilo, I mean, they're kind of a continuation of each, so it should be the same bug, and it is. It's E. coli, about 90%, all right? And then you have some other bugs that can cause this. Um, staph saprophyticus, we, we already talked about. That's very common, especially in sexually active people. You can have up to yellow. So there are many different types of bugs, right? but E. coli is the most common. Some lab findings that you might see in these infections, you might see white blood cells in the urine. You might see leukocyte, Esterase. This is an enzyme. Anything that has an ACE enzyme that's found in your white blood cells. So if you see white blood cell enzymes, you know, okay, there's probably some sort of infection here. You can see nitrates or nitrites because bacteria convert these and convert material into nitrites. And if it's pilo, then you'll start to get cast. You got white blood cell cast. All right, casts come from your kidneys. All right, so, if it's, so if you see casts, you know there's something wrong with your kidneys. I'm gonna talk about pilo in a little bit more detail. It has a little bit more complications. Yeah. We said pilo happens when bacteria ascend up your ureters. Usually that shouldn't be the case. Don't you have a valve here? Don't you have a valve here that closes? Well, if that valve doesn't close, then you get vesicle ureteral reflux. You get bladder ureter reflux. Fluid can build up. And when fluid builds up, then bacteria can kind of travel up that fluid and cause pyelonephritis. So I write vesicle ureteral, ureteral reflux. And very common, but some people, if this valve is really defunct, they don't just get one off infections. They might get monthly infections. They might get chronic infections. And chronic infections are never good. And chronic Pyelonephritis, your kidneys will get damaged. It'll start to get scarred. Does scar tissue work? No, scar tissue doesn't work. It'll start to atrophy. It'll start to look blunted. So you get a kidney that looks like this. That's a pretty bad looking kidney, ain't it? So you get things like scarred cortex. You get blunted calyces. I've seen questions where they just showed a scarred kidney, the calyces are blunted, and they say nothing more. You know, it's chronic pyelonephritis. It's that chronic infection, chronic inflammation, causing scarring, causing the blunting of your kidneys. It looks shriveled up, it looks gross. Chronic pyelonephritis. So that's what you see macroscopically, but microscopically, if you look at the kidneys, your, your kidneys start to hold these large casts that are pink, eosinophilic. And this looks a lot like your thyroid. Your thyroid has those large follicles that are nice and pink. Sometimes they call it, sometimes they call it thyroidization of kidneys. Because they look like your thyroid. And then our last topic, to close everything off, there's this very special type of pyelonephritis called xanthogranulomatous pilo. This is pyelonephritis that contains granulomas and fat-laden macrophages. And because you have all these granulomas and because you have all these macrophages that have fat in them, we call that xantho, that's the fat part, granulomatous pyelonephritis. Right? So the name kind of gives it away. And if they have all these variables in the question stem, then you can just judge by the name what it is. That does it for stones, kidney infections, bladder infections. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.